Welcome to the Granite Bay Hilltop Seventh-day Adventist Church. On behalf of the Health Ministries team, I'd like to welcome you here today for our amazing Health Expo 2023. I'm excited to announce, and um, uh, this second speaker that we have is a friend of mine. He lives locally, Dr. Randy Bivens. Dr. Randy Bivens graduated from Loma Linda University School of Medicine, and upon graduation, he completed an internship in internal medicine and re uh, his residency in diagnostic radiology. And I've always wondered, why is it that Randy and I always seem to get along? Well, my dad was a radiologist, so maybe that something had something to do with it. But Dr. Viv Bivens has a strong professional interest in lifestyle medicine, and he spent nine years as the COO at the famous Weimar Institute, uh, where it is the home of the New Start program. Uh, he also has a very strong business background, and as a businessman myself, maybe that's the reason why we also get along. But he serves on three nonprofit boards, he partners in seven LLCs, and is president of two medical consulting corporations. Either way, we're extremely blessed and thankful to have him here today to present his uh, talk. Uh, so please help me welcome up Dr. Randy Bivens. Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, it's interesting he was talking about I'm on some LSEs. I had to get up early this morning to, um, to chair a, a, a board call from a group of people that are going to Malawi next week. We've got a team of 25 healthcare professionals that are going to conduct the first open heart surgery in the country of Malawi ever. Um, so we're, we're kind of excited about it. If you would have asked me a year ago, I would have told you the chances were less than 50% that we could pull it off and do our first surgery on November 1, but it looks like it's going to happen and everybody's hopping on planes and heading there. We've got some team members already on the ground, so you know, that was how my day started. So th the question today is, would you really like to know how you're going to die? You know, some people actually do know how they're going to die, by the way. We're going to go over some of those, but would you really be interested in knowing how you're going to die? And actually, and more importantly, would you like to know how to avoid it? If you knew how you're going to die, and it's a disease of Western lifestyle, would you like to know how you could completely avoid it and die like the Hunzes do, die of natural causes? How would you like to do that? So the question is, is would you really like to know it? And we're going to talk about some people who actually do. Um, there's a disease called Huntington's disease. We used to call it Huntington's chorea. Huntington's disease is a complicated disease, but it's genetic. It usually becomes symptomatic after the age of 30. There's a 50% chance of inheriting this gene if one of your parents has it. So you don't know if you have it unless you get a genetic test. The early signs including changes in personality, irritability, and feeling clumsy. It's a disease that progresses many years, leading to death, and a simple genetic test could tell you if you have the gene. Um, there are genetic uh, tests for all kinds of things now, and it can help you. In this case, you would pretty much know if you have the gene positive, you pretty much know you're going to die of Huntington's disease. Um, we also know that there are genetic breast cancers. Um, about 3% of breast cancers and about 10% of ovarian cancers we know are related to genetic causes. Um, there's the BRCA1 gene and the BRCA2 gene, which you can actually test for, and if you're positive for it, you have a really high risk of getting breast cancer. In fact, there are favorite, famous celebrities who are BRCA1 positive who've had bilateral mastectomies and reconstruction because of the genetic propensity for having this disease. So you could know that you're going to get breast cancer through that genetic test, and you could choose to do something proactively to prevent it. So here's the elephant in the room, right? We can identify one comorbid condition that contributes or causes most of the deaths in America. I'm going to tell you, not right away, I'm teasing you, but I'm going to tell you about a cause of death that has a very high likelihood of killing you. Would you like to know what that is? If you knew it, would you like to take steps to avoid it? One comorbid condition, one, that if you reversed it, you could reverse six of the eight most frequent causes of death in America. So let's look at the causes of death in America in 2021. Heart disease was the number one cause. Cancer was the number two cause. They actually listed COVID-19 
that's debatable because there was a lot of COVID deaths that were assigned. If you came in with any disease and it looked like COVID and you died, you got labeled as a COVID death because unfortunately the insurance companies paid the hospitals more money. So I don't know if, it, definitely a lot of people died of COVID, but it was usually because of other comorbids. Um, so I don't know if that's really true, but it was a leading cause in 2021 according to the government. Preventable injuries, stroke, chronic lower respiratory disease, Alzheimer's, and diabetes mellitus. And I'm going to tell you an entity, a comorbid condition, that contributes or causes six of these eight leading causes of death. I'm just trying to tease you. I'm trying to think, try, like, what do you think that's going to be? Because we're going to tell you. There's one common theme that runs through most of these. What would it? It's called insulin resistance. If you don't know what insulin resistance is, you need to know what it is, and we're going to tell you what it is, and we're going to show you how insulin resistance contributes or actually causes most of the diseases of Western lifestyle. One entity. You know, I like to bundle. You know, it's like if I could just cure one entity. If you could control, manage, and reverse insulin resistance, you would dramatically lengthen your lifespan and dramatically reduce your risk of dying of most diseases of Western lifestyle, including cancer and stroke and heart disease. So this is an animation. This little um, pentate-shaped thing is a glucose molecule, and it's going to try to connect to the cell. And you'll notice the cell tried to receive the glucose, and the, the mechanism to transport decided it didn't want to let it in. Now, insulin is used as a glucose transport in almost every, every cell in the body, but one cell predominates over all other things. Almost all glucose and all insulin is mediated, this glucose transport is in one kind of cell, one cell. And that cell is the muscle cell. I couldn't have walked up here if my glucose transport system wasn't working and my insulin wasn't working because insulin actually helps the glucose get across the cell membrane, as we saw there, so that the glucose can get into the cell. Why does it want to get in the cell? It wants it to get in the cell because glucose is the engine. It's the fuel that's driving the engine. The mitochondria takes this and creates energy so that I can walk around and if I want to act like a fool up here. So you can see if you have a problem with the glucose transport system, it won't let the glucose into the cell. What happens? Well, there's two main things that happen right away. Your body recognizes that your cells don't have enough glucose in them, so they tell the pancreas to produce more insulin. Does that make sense? I mean, that's how the body works. God has made us in a miraculous way, so the pancreas cr creates more insulin so that it actually makes many more avenues so that the glucose can get into the cell. But eventually, that doesn't really work great. And so what happens is the amount of glucose in the bloodstream goes up. You understand that happens? You need to understand how that happens because that's critical to our understanding of the whole rest of this lecture. If you don't get this, you won't get the rest. So, so insulin is used as a transport mechanism to allow glucose into the cell. And we're going to talk about type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes used to be called juvenile onset diabetes. What happens with that is you have an autoimmune insult to the pancreas, to the, to the beta cells of the pancreas, so that the pancreas doesn't make insulin. If you don't make insulin, what's going to happen to the glucose in the cell, and into the, into the bloodstream? The glucose is going to go up because it can't get into the cell, so it accumulates in the bloodstream. The blood glucose goes up. We measure the blood glucose, and that's called diabetes. It's that simple. If your blood glucose is high, you have diabetes. In the case of type 1 diabetes, it's high because the pancreas can't make insulin. In the situation of type 2 diabetes, what we call adult onset, we don't call it adult onset already because as you learned in the prior lecture, you can have adult onset diabetes when you're six or seven years old. So it's not called adult onset anymore. It's called type 2 diabetes. 
In the case of type 2 diabetes, the problem is right here what we saw, this mechanism of insulin resistance. And because there's insulin resistance, because of a lifestyle, and we're going to explain how that happens and how we can reverse it, insulin levels are high and glucose levels are high. Do you understand that? I need just some yeses, because you need to understand this, because this is critical to the rest of our understanding of insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is a resistance to the hormone insulin resulting in increasing blood sugar, as we already explained. Insulin helps control the amount of sugar in the blood. You can see how that happens. If there's too much sugar in the blood, the pancreas makes more insulin. Even if there's insulin resistance, the pancreas kicks out more and more insulin, so insulin levels are high in type 2 diabetics. That's why. With insulin resistance, the body cells do not respond normally. Now, how many of you here in the room would guess that you're insulin resistant? Now, you, 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 don't, you may not even know how to test for it, but we're going to kind of give an estimate of how many people we think in this room might be insulin resistance. Glucose can't enter the cell as easily, so it builds up in the blood as we already learned. So according to a study published by the University of North Carolina, 88% of Americans are metabolically unfit, a hallmark sign of insulin resistance. 88%. Now, the group of people here in this room are probably healthier because you, try, you decided to come to a healthy lecture, okay? So maybe only 70% of you here in this room are insulin resistant. Are you hearing what I just said? 70% is my guess. There's a disease called prediabetes. Now, prediabetes is an interesting name. It shouldn't be called prediabetes. That's like being pre-pregnant. You, you know, you either have it or you don't. Pre-diabetes, it should have been called pre-treatment diabetes. Because with pre-diabetes, it's when your fasting blood sugar is between 100 and 126. Also, when your hemoglobin A1C is between 6 and 6.5%. So the, they're just numbers, but we can determine that you don't quite have diabetes yet. You actually do have diabetes already. We just haven't chosen to treat you yet. So it should have been called pretreatment diabetes because it turns out that the disease entity of diabetes, that is the risk, for example, heart disease and cancer and stroke, goes up. It actually goes up. Not as bad, but it's like two or three times greater in prediabetes. How do you know you have prediabetes? Well, you, didn't, you don't know if you have insulin resistance, but if you have prediabetes, guaranteed 100% you have insulin resistance. You understand that? So what are the incidents of people in this room that have prediabetes? It turns out that Yolo County um, exceeded 50% of its population two years ago. 50% of the population is a prediabetic pre in that county. Most of the counties around Sacramento are approaching or passing 50% of the population with patients with prediabetes. Did you hear that? Half of your neighbors, half of your friends, half of the people in the entire population are diseased with insulin resistance, prediabetes, and already are having the ravages of diseases occurring in their body. All of the people with prediabetes have insulin resistance. But there are people with insulin resistance that aren't yet prediabetic. So many of you in here are not prediabetic or diabetic, but you're insulin resistant. So insulin resistance is a much bigger group of people, probably at least 70% of you in this room are insulin resistant. So you're, everything I talk about, you're going to be subject to those diseases, and I'm telling you how you're going to die. Do you like that? Do you even want to know? Some of you might want to just get up and leave right now because you really don't want to know. So insulin resistance causes or contributes to six of these eight leading causes of death. So let's talk about the good, okay? We saw a whole bunch of good in this last lecture. Would you agree? Amazing pictures of some amazing foods that you could eat amazingly and save your life. So this is another picture of the good. 
you've seen this, and you've seen some of the reasons why you'd want to eat these whole plant-based foods. How much cholesterol is in this? None. You know, how much fiber is in this? None. This food promotes lowering your cholesterol. The high-fat foods contribute to raising your cholesterol. All the bad things that you heard about, this stops and reverses. Another picture of the good, whole grains, bananas, blueberries, legumes. We, we love legumes, especially for insulin resistance and for type 2 diabetics. We love legumes because legumes have some of the, they really have the highest fiber of the foods that we eat. And fiber is an amazing thing. There's both soluble and insoluble fiber. And these foods contribute to lowering your cholesterol, reducing your risk for cancer, especially colon cancer. We can affect your transit time in your colon. So if you have carcinogens that are being exposed to the lining of your gut, you, we can speed the time up. It just you, you evacuate faster. Instead of days in your bowel, your foods may stay only there for five or six hours because you have high fiber. So we're all exposed to toxins in the, in the environment, but if you expose your body to a shorter period of time, those toxins are there, you're much less likely to get disease. So we love fiber, 35 grams of fiber. It's not unusual to look at a standard American diet and find sometimes zero fiber or three grams of fiber, and we're recommending 35 and you don't have to wonder why people die. So healthy carbs. Healthy carbs are whole grains, fresh whole fruits, legumes, and starchy vegetables. Corn, potatoes, squash, green peas. You know, um, potatoes, you know, baked potatoes, when you're diabetic and you talk to a diabetic educator, they'll tell you to stay away from starch, right? T stay away from some carbs because your carbs are high in your bloodstream. I, t I ask patients, I go, does that work for you? Yeah, it does, a little bit. But it doesn't take the disease away. You still have diabetes. So you drop your blood sugar from, from 240 to 220 because you're eating less carbs. What's the problem with diabetes? The problem is, is, is the simple carbs, but the real, real elephant in the room is the saturated fat. The fat is what's causing the insulin resistance. Kind of a sidelight story. People say, how fast can I um, reverse this process of, of insulin resistance? How fast can I do it? I was the physician of, a, of a, a lifestyle program up in Washington State, and I had this lovely 88-year-old lady from Burnaby, British Columbia, and she was about 5'2 and weighed about 200 pounds. She'd had type 2 diabetes for 10 years, and we put her on a program of plant-based diet, exercise, plenty of water, just natural things, you know, no medicines, took her off her her anti-diabetic medication. Now, I only took her off half of her medication. On day three, um, my wife is back here. She and I were staying in a cabin, and we heard a knock on the door at about three in the morning. Dr. Bivens, Dr. Bivens, I think my roommate's dying. So I threw on some pants. It was in the same cabin. I went over, looked at her, and she enough sure looked like she was dying. She was flat on the floor. She was white as a sheet. She was diaphoretic. She was kind of sweating. Her eyes were kind of rolling up her, in, her, in her head. And, and I mean, she, I thought she was having a heart attack. I'm thinking, she's dying on my watch. I'm out in the woods. She's going to die. Her roommate, being a lot smarter than me, said, Dr. Bivens, do you think she might need some sugar. Now, that's an interesting question because if a person comes into the ear like that, we always give them sugar. Because if your sugar's high, making it a little higher doesn't hurt. But if your sugar's low, it could save your life. So I go, oh, yeah, uh, do you have any? You know, I don't have any of this medicine, but do you have any? She goes, well, I have some grape juice in the car. I go, run out and get it. So she went and got it. I made sure the patient could swallow so she wasn't going to be aspirating. She drank about four or five ounces of grape juice and in about five minutes. She was like 80% better. What had happened here? Well, what had happened was I was foolish as a physician because I hadn't taken off all of her anti-diabetic medication. I should have taken it all off. She was day three. She had reversed this insulin resistance problem that fast in an 88-year-old lady, and her blood sugar is now normal, and it dropped because of the medicine she was still taking, so it got below normal. 
So the truth is, we have the capacity to reverse this disease really fast. Not everybody, but I'm giving you an example of somebody who is 88 years old who did it in three days. Bad on me. I learned a lesson. I don't do that anymore. So we've learned about the good. Now let's talk about the bad. Because after the bad, we have the ugly. So what's the bad? The bad is insulin resistance and prediabetes. Okay, we're talking about insulin resistance as a cause of disease, and we're saying that many of you in this room have insulin resistance right now. And by reversing that insulin resistance, you can profoundly reverse your risk of disease, just to kind of review. So bad is insulin resistance and prediabetes, but then we have the ugly. The ugly is type 1 diabetes. Unfortunately, you can't do anything about that. That's not really true. That's a whole story in itself. But the cause of type 1 diabetes is probably partially related to giving whole milk um, or whole milk products, whole milk formulas to infants who then develop um, certain, if you have the genetic predisposition for type 1 diabetes, this might pull the trigger and initiate uh, an attack on your pancreas. So, that isn't the whole story, but it's actually part of the story. But type 1 diabetes is a disease that's genetic, and you get it usually in infancy or, you know, adolescent. I have a son who got it when he was 16. Well, you have it. You have it for the whole rest of your life. The good news is type 1 diabetes is, is the technology is amazing. They, they wear these monitors that are on them that just penetrate the skin a little bit, continuous monitoring of the blood sugar, and they have pumps, and sometimes they're connected and the pump gives you insulin, and so it modulates very much like your pancreas would do. It's not the same as having a pancreas, but the technology has just been amazing for treatment of type 1 diabetes. So that's the ugly of type 1 diabetes. Not much you can do about it. The problem with type 1 diabetes is that you can have type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes at the same time. Do you understand how that might happen? So you have type 1 diabetes, not your fault. You eat French fries and McDonald's and, you, you know, saturated fats and, you know, potato chips and processed foods and simple carbs and this bad diet, it's going to give you insulin resistance. It doesn't matter that you have type 1 diabetes and your pancreas can't produce insulin. It doesn't know that. It didn't get the memo. So you get type 2 diabetes also. So oftentimes we have people who come to our programs for reversing diabetes and they go, I have type 1 diabetes. Do you think that will help? And I go, it won't cure your type 1 diabetes, but I can guarantee you, almost, if a person is overweight and it looks like they probably have type 2 diabetes also, I go, there's a really good chance it will dramatically reduce your need for insulin. You're taking 20 units now. I saw one patient who was taking 20 units and it dropped to 8 after two weeks because they had insulin resistance in addition to the type 1 diabetes. Does that make sense? I just, I don't want to lose people because I talk fast sometimes and sometimes I move fast. So type 2 diabetes. We talked a bit about type 2 diabetes. We're going to talk a bit more. Type 2 diabetes, what's the incidence of type 2 diabetes? Well, we all already know that the pre-diabetes incidence is now over 50% in some surrounding counties. Half of the population, folks. And pre-diabetes is the precursor to actually having full-blown diabetes mellitus. How do you make the diagnosis of diabetes? It's really simple. Fasting blood sugar over 126 or a hemoglobin A1C over 6.5. That simple. You can do glucose tolerance tests. You can do other tests. But honestly, the simple test, I mean, can be done if you know somebody who has, who's taking insulin. They have a glucometer. You can go over to them and you say, I, haven't, I didn't eat anything last, since 5 o'clock last night. I just had water. I'm nothing. I'm fasting. It's 10 o'clock. And they'll do your blood sugar for you. They have a glucometer. You know, just find somebody that has one. It's that simple. And, and if it's over 126, you have diabetes. A lot of people with diabetes don't even know it. We're going to talk about type 3 diabetes. I'm going to kind of tease you a bit now. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but we're going to talk about type 3 diabetes also. So what is diabetes? It's a disease in which the body's ability to produce or respond to the hormone insulin is impaired. So you either can't produce it, or you're producing it, and it's not working right, resulting in abnormal metabolism of carbohydrate and elevated levels of glucose in your blood and your urine, by the way. In fact, the father of medicine, Hippocrates, 
could diagnose diabetes, do you know how he did it? Someone does back there. They tested the urine. They tasted the urine. If the urine's sweet, you're dumping sugar into your urine, you have diabetes. Now, they didn't know how to treat it, but they could diagnose it. So they knew about diabetes before the time of Christ. Because most people have a threshold for dumping urine, I mean, sugar into the urine. Most people's threshold is a level of about 250. It varies. But at some point in that time, you start dumping sugar into your urine, raising all kinds of problems. Increases your risk for urinary tract infection because now you have a food source for the bacteria in your blood, in your urines. So there's all kinds of problems of having sugar in your urine. In addition, sugar is is hyperosmolar, so it sucks you know, liquid in, fluid, so it actually, you get dehydrated, there's just all kinds of problems. So refined carbs and red meats are driving a global rise in type 2 diabetes, the study states. So gobbling up too many refined, this is a very recent article, by the way, gobbling up too many refined wheat and rice products along with eating too few whole grains is fueling the growth of new cases of type 2 diabetes worldwide according to a new study. Now, it was published in 2018, but you know the studies take three or four years before you get the data before you can actually publish it. So it's not like I got it in 2018 and I reported it in January 2019. It doesn't work that way. Our study suggests poor carbohydrate, carbohydrate quality is a leading driver of diet attributable type 2 diabetes globally. We have a significant problem with diabetes mellitus here in this country, but we're not the giant problem. The giant problem of diabetes is India because of their population base. Another key factor, people are eating far too much red and processed meats such as bacon, sausage, salami, and the like. The study says those three factors, eating too few whole grains, too many processed grains, and meats were the primary drivers in over 14 million new cases of type 2 diabetes in 2018. This is just in the U.S. This is not globally. 14 million new cases of type 2 diabetes in 2018 related to one thing. Lifestyle. Diet. In, in fact, the study estimated 7 out of 10 cases, 70% of type 2 diabetes worldwide in 2018 were linked to poor food choices. So let's talk about diabetes. In 2015, there were 30 million people with diabetes in the US, now 37 million. Do you see a difference? Of the 30 million, 7 million were undiagnosed. Now 8.5 million. There's 8.5 million people walking around with type 2 diabetes that don't even know it. 25.2% of seniors over 65 had diabetes in 2015. It's now 29%. Over 50% of those seniors have prediabetes. Now, again, prediabetes doesn't mean you don't have the disease yet. We just haven't chosen to start treating the disease yet. You should treat the disease whether you know you have it or not. You treat it through lifestyle because not only will you reduce your risk for diabetes, but as we're going to see, it's going to reduce the risk for a whole host of diseases of Western lifestyle. Is that you're seeing that common thread through these lectures. Eighty-five million Americans had prediabetes in 2015. It's now 96 million. That number is actually higher. It's actually now about 120 million. And 80% of the people with prediabetes don't know they have it. So if you have a bad lifestyle, if you're, you know, over 20 pounds over your ideal body weight, if you have high cholesterol, if you have hypertension, and if I'm ringing any bells, you can, you know, think of that might be you, you should get your blood sugar tested. If you don't want to do a fasting blood sugar, it's a bit more. They have to do a venipuncture, but the, actually even a more accurate way is a hemoglobin A1C. I'll just explain really quick what A1C is. I keep referring to it. Glucose is a very sticky molecule. It sticks to everything. It creates havoc, and that's why we don't like to have a lot of glucose in your bloodstream. It sticks to the hemoglobin molecule. The hemoglobin molecule is the molecule that transports oxygen. Glucose will stick to the hemoglobin molecule. It does it to everybody. But if your blood sugar is higher, the amount of molecules that have sugar stuck to them is higher. 
So we take a sample and we look at the percentage of hemoglobin molecules that have sugar on them. And if it's over 6.5% of those, you have the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. Now, how high can it go? I've seen A1Cs as high as 18%. I'm sure it's possible to even go higher, but the blood sugars are, have to be so highly sustained. Now, here's what's really, really cool about A1C. A1C is a measure of your blood sugar for the last 90 days because that's the average lifespan of a red blood cell, the hemoglobin. So you have patients that go, I'm going to the doctor on Tuesday of next week. It's now Sunday, so I think I better clean up my act. You know, I need to, you know, not eat so many carbs. I need to eat some legumes. I need to, you know, do all those sorts of things, and I'm going to get my fasting blood sugar down. I know that'll work. Well, the doctor is smarter than that, and he, he draws an A1C. And he says, I don't care what you've been doing the last two days because the A1C tells me what your blood sugar levels have been for the last 90 days. So you can see how that's a bit more accurate measure. So that's, that's how we do it. And it's just a simple percentage of the number of hemoglobin molecules that have sugar stuck on them. It's this, diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the US. It's the number one cause of kidney failure. It's the number one cause of lower limb amputation. It's the number one cause of adult blindness in America. Here you have a disease that's completely, listen to this, completely preventable. And it's the number one cause of kidney disease. If you go to any dialysis unit in America, more than 50% of those patients are there because of diabetes, a reversible, preventable disease. And we're paying for it, by the way. Those of us who choose not to have the disease, we're paying. Dialysis is a profoundly expensive process, and we're all paying for it. It's the most common cause of adult blindness in America. It's the most common cause of limb amputation in America, exceeding accidents. This is a disease that's terrible if you have, you know, people say, well, it runs in families. It runs in families because the family taught you how to eat. And you know how it is to die with diabetes because Uncle Joe had it. And he had his foot amputated, and then his lower below knee amputation, and then he went blind, and then he went on dialysis, and then he had a heart attack while in a dialysis unit, and he died. So guess what? You know how you're going to die. No guessing there. Over 400,000 deaths per year are listed diabetes as the cause of the underlying cause of death. Now that's diabetes directly. What I'm telling you is insulin resistance is a comorbid condition in many more diseases and probably contributing to millions of deaths in America. Do you understand? Diabetes mellitus by itself is causing 400,000, but the other problems, the problem of insulin resistance is a comorbid condition in many other diseases. Heart disease is the number one cause of death. Insulin resistance is a major comorbid condition. You could have diabetes mellitus and you die of a heart attack. They list it out as, as a heart attack, but it turns out your diabetes mellitus is probably what caused the heart attack. So here's type 1 diabetes. We talked about it. This is a healthy pancreas on, it would be your left, um, where the pancreas is stimulated. It produces insulin, and the insulin helps glucose get absorbed. But in the right, you have these, um, this disease. The pancreas can't produce insulin enough, and so you don't have enough transport vehicles to move the glucose into the cells. So type 1 diabetes. It's one no, once known as juvenile onset or insulin-dependent diabetes. It is still insulin-dependent. It's pretty much the only treatment for type 1 diabetes. Maybe not initially. Sometimes there's a little diabetic holiday where you may not in, need insulin for a while, but eventually they're going to need insulin. It's a chronic condition in which the pancreas produces little or no insulin. It doesn't exactly produce no insulin, but it produces not enough insulin and eventually, maybe it'll produce no insulin. And insulin is the hormone which allows sugar to enter cell so that it can produce energy, as we've already learned. Despite active research, there's no known cure. They're getting close to a pancreas transplant, but that's been fraught with all kinds of problems. Pancreas is a very 
difficult organ to transplant. And uh, the technology of glucose monitoring and glucose pumps is so sophisticated now that it's approaching the effectiveness of having a real pancreas. By the way, I don't know if we mentioned it, type 1 diabetes only accounts for 5% of the diabetes. The, the lion in the room, the elephant in the room, is type 2 adult onset diabetes, which represents 90 to 95% of the rest. When I talk about diabetes, almost universally I'm talking about adult onset type 2 diabetes. And there's the numbers. So let's talk about type 2 diabetes, and we've been kind of alluding to this, this whole lecture. We have yet to get to type 3 diabetes, and that's the one that should scare you. Type 2 diabetes is caused when certain cells in your body become resistant to insulin. These cells include the liver, muscle, and fat cells. Um, most of the insulin is used for muscle cells. These cells become resistant to the ability of insulin to perform its duty. Insulin unlocks the door that allows glucose into the cell. If glucose can't get into the cell, it's an obvious conclusion that the blood sugar rises in the bloodstream, therefore the diagnosis of diabetes. So if your blood sugar is over 126 on fasting because it can't get into the cell, it wants to get into the cell, that's where it's worthless out in the bloodstream, but it wants to get in the cell. If it can't get, it builds up, it's over 126, you have the diagnosis of diabetes. So let's talk about type 3 diabetes. I'm not going to read that, we're just going to go. The idea that Alzheimer's might be type 3 diabetes has been around since 2005. Insulin not only keeps the blood vessels that supply the brain healthy, it also encourages the brain's neurons to absorb glucose, allowing those neurons to change and become stronger. So if you have a situation in which you have high insulin levels, like type 2 diabetes, you think, well, it needs insulin, maybe that's a good thing. We're going to learn that that isn't true. Low insulin levels means lower brain function. We already know that people with type 1 diabetes have low insulin levels. They also have some cognitive problems related to low insulin levels and low brain function. We well know that the abnormal brain effects that low insulin creates in type 1 diabetes, starting with decreased concentration. So if you take a type 1 diabetic, and they have low insulin levels, we know that they have problems with concentration. It can eventually lead to loss of consciousness, seizures, and eventually death. How do you solve that? You give them exogenous insulin. The development of giving patients insulin is a fairly recent phenomena. In the, I think around 1925 in Toronto, Canada, the first patient received a, a kind of a concentrate of a crushed up, I think it was a bovine pancreas, a cow pancreas. And this 15-year-old kid was expected to die within a week, and it saved his life. This is a fairly recent phenomena where we've used insulin to save patients' lives with type 1 diabetes. But if you don't have enough insulin, eventually, your blood sugar goes down and you have a seizure, and if it keeps going, you die. However, what would happen if there was plenty of insulin, but those cells were resistant to that insulin? In the case of type 2 diabetes, we have lots of insulin floating around, more than average, by the way, a lot of insulin. It would have the same effect of the cell as low levels of insulin, even though the blood levels of insulin are normal to high. So the cells are resistant to the insulin, you're getting this, so even though the insulin level is high, the cell is resistant to it, so it's going to have the same effect as a type 1 diabetic that has very low insulin levels. This phenomenon is known as double diabetes or hybrid diabetes, and it's harder to diagnose and significantly more difficult to treat. The truth is the patient can have triple diabetes. You can have type 1, type 2, and type 3 diabetes all at the same time. 
Turns out the type 1 is the easiest diagnose because they've usually had it for a while. They got it when they were 10 or thereabouts. And I mean, you just, you know they have type 1 diabetes. The type 2 diabetes is a lifestyle program because of the insulin resistance. And because of the insulin resistance, they develop type 3 diabetes or cognitive dysfunction because of the insulin resistance. And we're going to, as we're going to see, dramatically increased risk of developing dementia and specifically Alzheimer's. Am I scaring anybody yet? I hope so. Come on. The, sometimes the only way you can change is to get scared. Okay? You, you, you can have the, the knowledge, and the knowledge didn't, 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 didn't work in the past, didn't, didn't work last week, didn't work last year. How about if I try scaring you? All right. We're, there is good news. So dementia is a group of symptoms that affect mental cognitive tasks such as memory and reasoning. It's an umbrella term that Alzheimer's disease falls under. So Alzheimer's is one of a group of dementias. Does that make sense? Okay. So Alzheimer's and dementia are the same. Dementia is a big umbrella, and Alzheimer's fits into that. Most dementias, by the way, are Alzheimer's, as we'll learn, but it isn't all of them. It can occur due to a variety of conditions. The most common is Alzheimer's, as we just said. It's possible to have more than one type of dementia at the same time. So kind of a double whammy. You know, how about get Alzheimer's and a different form of dementia all at the same time? All that means is you're just probably going to die faster. Alzheimer's accounts for 60 to 80% of all dementias. So when we talk about insulin resistance effect on dementia, we're specifically talking about its effect in your, your ability to have Alzheimer's, not the rest of the dementias, just so you understand. We're not talking about all dementias, we're talking about Alzheimer's. In 1906, Dr. Alzheimer noticed changes in a brain tissue of a woman who had died of an unusual mental condition. He did some pathologic slides of her brain and he noticed some unusual things and he was the one who originally diagnosed the first case of, it wasn't the first case of Alzheimer's, but it was the first diagnosed case. Her symptoms included memory loss, language problems, and unpredictable behavior. Um, this is the hippocampus in patients and we're gonna show you a coronal MRI my specialty, because I'm a diagnostic radiologist, but the hippocampus shrinks in Alzheimer's. I'm going to just tell you, many things that happen in Alzheimer's, we don't really understand why yet. We just know some of it. But we know the risk factors that will cause you to have Alzheimer's. This is a coronal MRI, and I will just tell you to take it on faith that the hippocampus is getting smaller over time. Alzheimer's is a progressive and fatal brain disorder that gradually destroys a person's memory and ability to learn, reason, make judgment, communicate, and carry out daily activities. As it progresses, individuals may have changes in personality, behavior, such as anxiety, suspiciousness, agitation, and delusions. Clinically, Alzheimer's is manifested by progressive memory loss and a gradual decline in cognitive, fu cognitive function, eventually leading to premature death of individuals that occurs typically three to nine years after the initial diagnosis. This is not something you want. My ex-wife, um, we were married right here in Carmichael. Um, passed away a year ago from Alzheimer's. This is real disease. And she, she actually got prema, and she was young for Alzheimer's. Symptoms of early onset Alzheimer's, uh, memory loss. <laughs> Thing is, as you get older, we all forget things. And you go, oh my goodness, maybe I have Alzheimer's. <laughs> no, you're getting old. <laughs> you know, that happens to all of us. Um, there are things you can do um, to uh, prevent that, and I'll just give you a, a sidebar. Um, um, one of our sons, it was recommended that he get a, a hyperbaric chamber for treatment uh, of some, some kind of you know, ADHD problems or something along that line, that the hyperbaric oxygenation. The problem is you need about 40 sessions. 
And the thing is sitting in our, um, in our dining room, unfortunately, right now. And my son is off in Tennessee at college. And so um, I've now done my seventh session in there because I'm thinking, I have a bit of memory loss and maybe some hyperbaric oxygen. I don't know. It may not hurt, but I, I, it may not help, but I don't think it'll hurt. So there's a lot of things you can try. We don't know for sure. But I tell you, honestly, of all these things, this lifestyle, this plant-based you know, medicine is probably the best thing you could do for all of these things we're talking about. You know, people say, you know, I would tell people, if you do this, you'll live 10 years longer. And they go, I don't want to live longer. I already feel terrible. And I go, listen, not only are you going to live longer, but it's going to feel better. It's going to feel better while you're getting longer. And then you're going to die of natural causes by not w- waking up some morning. Praise God. That's how it should happen. Difficulty completing familiar tasks. Difficulty determining time or place. A vision loss. Difficulty finding the right words. As you, get, you know, most of us have this already. It's like, okay, at what point do I call it Alzheimer's? Misplacing items frequently. Difficulty making decisions. These are the early signs of early onset Alzheimer's. 4% of patients with Alzheimer's develop before the age of 65. There's 4 million patients with Alzheimer's, so that means 200,000 of them got it before the age of 65. Most patients with early onset develop symptoms in their 40s or 50s. While there's no consensus to the exact cause of Alzheimer's, we don't know that brains get clogged with what's called beta amyloid plaques. One idea going around is that the plaques themselves that cause the symptoms but they're, it's not the, the plaques themselves, but it's the precursors, a little molecule called an oligomer, that is actually, the, the, the plaque is actually trying to isolate the oligomers so that the oligomers are really the problem. So the insoluble beta amyloid plaques that we see pathologically in brains with Alzheimer's could actually be the brain's way of trying to isolate these toxic oligomers. I'm trying to slow down because sometimes just processing this information. The same enzymes break down both insulin and oligomers. Okay, let that sink in for a second. What did I just tell you happens in insulin resistance? What's their insulin levels? High. So the same enzyme that breaks down insulin is also the same enzyme that breaks down the oligomers. So if you have a lot of insulin, this enzyme's doing all of its work trying to break down the insulin that's too high, and there's not left over, any left over to break down the oligomer, and therefore the Alzheimer's. Did you get that? In addition, the oligomers prevent insulin from binding to its receptors in the hippocampus. Kind of a double whammy. It's causing its own insulin resistance. Everyone thinks that amyloid buildup as a consequence of the events that cause cognitive impairment is diabetes, but we're saying it's actually the cause. It means that cognitive decline seen in type 2 diabetes may actually be early stage Alzheimer's. The problem is further complicated by the fact that not all patients with type 2 diabetes get Alzheimer's. However, their risk is much higher. It's at least double. So it should be clear that type 2 diabetes does not cause Alzheimer's. You you need to take that message away. Don't go away and say, Dr. Bivens told me that type 2 diabetes caused Alzheimer's. But they have the same root, a lifestyle condition that can clearly be reversed and prevented given the correct parameters. That's the take-home message. It doesn't guarantee that if you follow this lifestyle, you won't get Alzheimer's. And we're going to tell you why. There's a gene called APOE4, which is present in up to 20% of the population. Having two copies of APOE4, one from the mother, one from the father, does increase your risk of getting Alzheimer's 
but the increase is variable. So there's a genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's and the apolipro apolipoprotein E4, and there's three forms of this gene, and the E4 is the bad one. 50% of patients with Alzheimer's have this E4 gene, but only 20% of the population does. Did you get that? So clearly, if you have E4, you're much more likely to get Alzheimer's. The gene interrupts how the brain processes insulin. That combined with a high-fat diet together induces insulin resistance. So there's three variants of the APOE gene, and we're going to kind of go through those. APOE2, you hope you have that one, because 5 to 10 percent of the population does have it, and it reduces your risk for Alzheimer's. It protects you. Well, who, you know, get a genetic test, and you got APOE2, you know, you win the lottery. APOE3 is considered neutral. About most of us have the neutral gene, the APOE3, but the APOE4 increases your risk by 10 to 15 percent. Or, no, I'm sorry, 10 to 15 percent of the population has E4 already. But 50 percent of people with Alzheimer's have the E4 gene. Now, as you know, there, you have two parents. And since you have two copies, E2E2 has the lowest risk, and E4E4 has the highest risk. You follow that? Because you got a copy from your mother and a copy from your father. So if you have a family history of Alzheimer's, and it's only in your mother's side, and your father doesn't have any history of Alzheimer's in the family tree, it's possible that you have one copy of E4. Now, it's possible that you could have E2E4, and that would kind of almost cancel it itself out and make it somewhat neutral. What you don't want is E4E4, E4, and what you do want is E2E2. E2. We're on the home stretch. So to make sense of this, type 2 diabetes doubles your risk of Alzheimer's. Why does it do that? Because of insulin resistance. So even if you don't have type 2 diabetes, if you have insulin resistance, it does dramatically increase your risk for Alzheimer's. What's the rough guess of how many people in this room have insulin resistance? 70%. Did you guys catch that? 88% of the general population. I was just giving you a little hedge because I think most of you are healthier because you're here at this program. A first-degree relative doubles your risk because of the genetic tree. You understood that? Hypertension, central obesity, and sleep apnea incrementally increases your risk for Alzheimer's. So let's have a final exam. If I can treat and properly treat my type 2 diabetes, will that reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's? Let's see if you are listening, because this next slide is your final exam. And if you didn't listen to anything else, this one is the take-home message. Here it is. If, if you reverse type 2 diabetes, is it reversible? Absolutely. If you reverse hypertension, is it reversible? Absolutely. Now, that's not 100%, because there are some things called essential hypertension or genetic causes. But in almost all cases, uh, David DeRose, I think, um, used to go to church here, an amazing lifestyle physician, wrote a book on reversing hypertension, one of the best books. If you want to naturally reverse hypertension, that's the book to read. So if you reverse type 2 diabetes, if you reverse hypertension, if you reverse central obesity, if you achieve ideal body weight, if you exercise at least 45 minutes per day, if you eat a diet rich in nutrients, consuming plant-based foods, avoiding processed foods, especially oils and simple carbohydrates, your risk for Alzheimer's would be dramatically lower. Now, let me just tell you the rest of the story. So 
we've dramatically reduced your risk for Alzheimer's. What have we done for the rest of the diseases of lifestyle medicine? I mean, uh, we've, we've, we've reduced your risk to cancer by 80%. We've reduced your risk by heart disease by close to 100%. If your cholesterol is less than 149, I've never seen a patient with a cholesterol less than 149 have a heart attack. Okay, you following me? You do reduce your risk for stroke to almost zero. You reduce your risk for diabetes mellitus to zero. These were the major causes of death. Did you remember when we listed those? Those are the major causes of death. Heart disease, cancer, number one, number two. Preventable injuries. The truth is, it probably reduces your risk for preventable injuries because you're more acute. Your brain is more aware. You're more careful. You're, you're more li less likely to have an injury related to accident. So not only will this reduce your risk for Alzheimer's, it will set the groundwork for you to live not 9.5 years longer, which is the Adventist health study of how much longer Seventh-day Adventists live. We're talking 20 to 30 years longer or more. So if you want to know how you're going to die, don't do any of these things, and you already know. Because I've told you, I've given you convincing evidence, and I know how you're going to die. If you want to avoid that, listen to what you've been hearing, make changes, be afraid of some of these diseases. You can be afraid of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, but the problem with being afraid of those is like, oh, I can take some insulin, you know, it's 20 years before I'll go blind, you know, whatever. You get Alzheimer's, you're toast. Okay? If you have any questions, um, we're just about out of time. I think we've got like two or three more minutes, but um, I think we'll just kind of conclude here. I'm going to be milling around. If you have any questions, you're welcome to come find me. Okay, thank you. <laughs>